and this county. conference will now be recorded. Exact references. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. The uh, as some of the essence of the community grid concept uh, is reconnecting the city. And here's a diagram on the south side. It might take you a second, but the center of the city is at the top. Syracuse University is to the right uh, portion. And the green space is primarily to the lower left and to the left are the south side community. Um, you can see the 81 path that is now going to be the community grid uh, there. And the concept is, again is to reconnect the city. One of the projects, part of the project that's most significantly not being represented is reconnecting the existing south side of our city to the, uh, the, the uh, business loop, as it's being called, which is what Almond, Almond Street will be through the city. And uh, currently, the DOT has the area between 41 South and Martin Luther King as a higher speed area and then slowing everybody down at the Martin Luther King intersection. <clears throat> we are suggesting and have suggested, and the DOT has responded, to do more connectivity uh, on this portion and keep the speeds low since this is a residential neighborhood and connects to the South Salina Street corridor. Next, please. The um, land trust concept could be used and has been considered for all of the years of this DOT project, if not before. Van Robinson and Mike Atkins and, and, and um, New York Civil Liberties Unions report refer to land trust com concepts for strengthening the power of, of development and economic value for the, for the deprived and de depleted south side of the city of Syracuse. This diagram that I'm showing here, Southside Renaissance, has been a concept that's been started and recharged over 20, if not more years, to deal with the quality and the character of the rich resources of housing, the housing types, and um, the neighborhood commercial streets that used to be so viable. One thing that is critical to this whole process is how, when I-81 went in here, in the 50s, it literally chose to go through the center of resources that were viable and economically sound, and it took those away from this city. And in simplest terms, the bypassing of the south, the 81 that went through the city, bypassed existing commercial neighborhoods on South Salina Street and North Salina Street, and atrophied those areas economically and as quality places to live. We do not need the same decisions to speed by quality areas of the city for housing. We cannot use the same design terms that were used in the 60s as rationales for speed for transportation in, this, in these critical residential and commercial neighborhoods of both North and South Salina Street. Next slide, please. The, uh, here's the diagram of the South Sal Salina Street uh, in blue, that's South Salina Street you see in the center of this kind of zone area. Um, and the blue strip is uh, South Salina Street and Cortland Ave. And the red snake through here, the red line, is the I-81 corridor snug up against Oakwood Cemetery to the right. What's critical here is that this speed and lack of connectivity to our south side atrophied the south side. It bypassed it deliberately, caused the closing of Oakwood Cemetery's historic connection to the city and actually damaged that cemetery's architectural and historic resources for 50 to 60 years, you know, almost beyond recognition. Uh, again, uh, it's a crime and it's a financial loss what's happened to Oakwood Cemetery because of I-81 closing that South Gateway. There are ways, uh, but that's one example. And the other examples are it actually took businesses and housing quality away from the south side. So a land trust could reestablish an area for economic control and development based on this new plan. Next slide. So the, so the, the component here, there you go. This slide shows, the, no, back one, Diane, thanks. This slide shows the concept we're proposing to the DOT for increasing the amount of connectivity to the south side to what needs to be for access for residents, for shoppers, for businesses, for supplies, for food, 
to get to the South Salina Street primary commercial corridor and not bypass the South Side again. This, in my humble view, is critical uh, for our city's future. It's been lost, uh, and I'll say enough on that. Let's go to the next, please. Um, thank you. One critical issue that we can all speak to is that Almond Avenue and the new streets through our city should be not be as wide as the current right of way. Um, the maximum we, we showed in the uh, Rethink 81 uh, rendering for development, we showed an intersection of Almond Avenue, and I think this might be uh, Harrison Street actually, with Almond being in the north-south vertical one. But the maximum street width needs to be let needs to be adequate for driving and parking, but no bigger. And there are standards for this, and we've said to the DOT, and we continue want to continue to say, we're looking for everybody to continue to say this. Maximum street width of Almond Street should be 110 to 120 feet. David Ashley, I know, is the champion on this recently. Again, we've all been talking about this for the six to eight years of this project that you design standards for safety and commercial viability and quality of place are achieved with certain design control standards. This is two lanes of traffic in each direction for Almond Ave, a center median that can be planted or neck down to a turning lane, parallel parking both sides of the street for adequate parking, a tree zone, a bike zone, and a pedestrian sidewalk to create the public realm and complement the street. We don't want another West Street wide concrete swath through the city to be Almond Avenue, which is what the DOT rendering shows. I didn't show it, I would have in the plan, but I didn't have it all together. Um, so Almond Street needs to be, I've said all that. Let's go to the next slide. I think you can make the point. These other examples are shown of other cities are doing the same thing. This Almond Avenue swath part right now looks appropriate but it's not as narrow as it could be let's go to the next one because we want to get to some public comment here um yeah this was a section that did not get fully developed about the green incentives and the sustainable incentives along highways that are going on all the way across the country it's an area that i've i've got a lot on and we can develop further at another time just looking at, say, the north side, in other words, uh, along 7th North Street and north all the way up to 41 North, a type of integrated energy. Here's a parking garage in, in Arizona with a full solar roof uh, covering the cars, making energy and providing parking next to their freeway. This, These kinds of things can happen along 81 North with the kind of sustainable and uh, and uh, smart growth planning incentives along this development zone that we're suggesting here. Next, please. There's many things we could do: water reclamation, soil reclamation. Uh, let's go. Let's go back. No, I better not. Since let's let's uh, let's leave it here for a second. Um, so I've talked about possibilities. I've shown some not very well, but in concept. Uh, we this is all about this proposal in concept is to um is to bring a new project to complement the dot project let the city stand tall let the state stand tall and show that uh the, the two billion dollar dot project is is something that needs to be done it's long overdue it can be corrected it has been successful to this point you must complement the dot team for their creativity in this project over this past eight years and over the requests of this community for 20 years now. Um, it, the viaduct is going to come down, <laughs> even though it's not a record of decision yet, and the street grid is going to be connected. We're going to take away the bottlenecks, provide many alternate routes to different destinations in the city. It's not about driving through the city. It's about getting to the place you want to go. Um, so this, uh, we need to support the DOT team in the strongest ways uh, to make the best people-friendly design, bring those design standards for quality resident places where people live, not drive. <laughs> the hard part here is the DOT team, it's hard for them to design places for people to live. They design places for people to get to 70 miles an hour and try and be safe on their way. 
so let's bring good design standards to the DOT team. Uh, let's bring uh, safety, health to the and, and quiet neighborhoods for quality of place where people want to live. We need to, through this proposal, come together as the city and the county, and I think there are so many things that are potentially coming together at this point to make uh, it right to create a second body bucket of money to complement the DOT uh, uh, IED-1 project with local sustainable projects for the neighbors of the IED-1. This will deal with residential neighborhoods that have been damaged for years. It'll deal with wetland areas damaged by highway construction. It'll deal with promoting intersections like 7th North Street intersections and the hotel district north of Destiny. And it can look to Destiny's future uh, in the sense of, of that vehicle will also transform in the next 20 to 40 years using existing structures, existing embedded energy will change the paradigm for how we look at new growth in the future. This can all come together in this type of a initiative at this time for Syracuse. So I think I've gone on long enough. We know, John, that we want to get to some of our friends. I wonder if now, and I haven't thought this through too clearly, if, uh, and I don't know who's on, I think, is, is Joe Driscoll on? What I wanted to do here, let me describe this quickly. I know that's a ton of stuff, but if each of our guests here, which I'll, I'll try and go through one by one, could spend about five minutes with your gut instincts or questions about this type of sustainable growth development along the neighbors of the IED-1. And Joe Driscoll, who is common counselor and musician, international musician, good stuff. I've got your early CDs. Uh, Joe, might you be on and uh, might you begin the, the talk? Yeah, for sure, Bob. Thanks for that presentation. And um, I guess, you know, my my uh, gut reaction right away is, you know, this is um, perfect timing. I think, I think, uh, yeah, this is completely what we should be doing and the conversations we should be having. I was just on uh, with the mayor and the leadership meeting this morning, and he was talking about, so I guess my, my first thought is, um, talking with the mayor this morning, he's just released today his plans for the ARPA funding for the federal money and he has set aside a million aside uh, for I-81 specific design and planning. Um, so that's really exciting news. I think there will be uh, you know a lot of the stuff that we were trying to reach out to uh, different fundraisers and organizations to help us do some of this design and planning. I think we'll uh, we'll have a, a, a solid budget now to get into this. So I think it's, you know, with, with all these uh, with all these types of projects um, on this scale, I think, you know, the most important thing is uh, making sure we get all the stakeholders together in a room and, and kind of, you know, everybody sees all these different organizations see it from one angle. And if you can get everybody together, you get a 360 picture of, of the whole thing because people are working in different corners, doing different work. Um, so yeah, I think it's uh, really important that we uh, continue to connect with, um, you know, I know Stephanie Pasquale and um, Bill Simmons have done extensive community outreach alongside, uh, you know, of course they're working with Lanessa and uh, the Night Clue uh, organization. So I think, um, you know, uh, everything you're saying, Bob, is is, is spot on. Uh, I plan on introducing a resolution at some point, just trying to figure out the best time uh, to introduce it. But I think we as a community need to bring it forward as a um, a proactive advocacy effort to make sure to ensure that you know we uh, I, I I forget who all a lot of people that are on this call came with us when we went to Rochester to check out the Interloop project, and I was just up there last night um and uh checking it out again and i think that um you know one of the the, the most important conversation uh, around 81 you know we've always said that bringing it to grade won't necessarily uh accomplish the goals of creating more equity more connectivity um it's going to have to be intentional planning and, and a big part of that is uh ensuring first and foremost that we are proactive in reaching out to the state and uh, requesting that all the land uh, be turned in. So I think that's where the conversation needs to go next. We need to ensure that that's happening. Uh, but also, uh, as we begin that advocacy campaign, um, as I said, why I've been waiting to drop the um, resolution is also, 
having a vision, um, you know, having visions of, of, you know, the talk of the land trust, like, is that, is that where we're going? And what will be the proactive vision? And I think a lot of that has to, uh, you know, we have to start initiating those conversations with the, some of the community stakeholders that Stephanie and, and Bill and, and Lanessa have, have already got in the room and, and really just develop that. But I think, I think overall, um, this, this, you know, this whole, this whole plan and, and vision uh, that you're laying out here, Bob, is exactly what we need to be talking about. I think it's very doable. I think it's just a matter of uh, getting the right people together and, and moving forward. And like I said, with the mayor's money that's coming in, I think that, um, you know, when this federal funding comes in, we'll have, um, you know, a sizable amount of resources to get accomplished as well. So I, I feel very positive about everything today. And I think uh, we're off to a good start. And we just got to, you know, execute now. Good. Thank, thank you, Joe. I, I, as you're speaking, I realized that I didn't go through a couple key components here about how we organize and how we fund. So you're right. This is a concept day. We're just talking about some ideas and how to do it. Diane, could I ask you to go back two slides and I'll add this to the conversation. Um, three, let's keep going there. Got to go back to funding and organization. A couple more. Whoa, where are we? Keep going. What the heck? It's in here somewhere. Okay, right there. Okay, let's, I talked a little bit about the distinct development characteristics and so on. These are the qualities that would be a checklist for sustainable and smart growth. Let's go to the next slide. And the, and the, yeah, the key, key aspects here is project funding and agency organization. And I think that, as Joe just mentioned, as we all know, and we've been hearing about different funds and different organizations, this would be combined city, county, state, and federal sustainable development and community foundations will be looking to not have one source kind of have to pay for or, or to create this development zone, but many sources. And it might be a little bit from each of these different groups and it might be at different times that one takes more of a lead than the other, whether it's city, whether it's some of the funds that have been coming in. Um, certainly the monies that the, Joe has mentioned that the mayor is putting forward towards the 81 project, it, it, it yet needs to be defined as how we put the existing talents of our planning entities together towards this proposal of the neighbors of um, I-81 development zone to focus that on a significant plan to heal those scars through the city. The second portion here is, is the agency organization. In other words, we would need a planning entity to manage and, and run this. And the new Neighbors of I-81 Development Authority will be suggested here that I'm suggesting that we locate it within the existing SOCPA office or Syracuse Onondaga County Planning Agency as the county lead agency and control for city and county coordination of planning, internal and external. So it would be, uh, uh, staff would include a new director of sustainable development for this zone and coordinator for financial and grant coordinator with the existing GIS staff and planning coordination, which is now in SOCPA under the current directorship. So, and again, this, these are new ideas that would have to be discussed and thought through, but this was a proposal to look at our existing resources and nest this development zone and fund it through the, all of the existing entities that are available to us. And with those two parts that I left out, maybe um, if Rachel May, and I haven't paid attention here, has been able to join us, uh, our state senator and champion of sustainability, certainly in the central New York area. Uh, if possibly Rachel might be on board and could pick up some comments on this. Sure, I'm here, Bob, can you hear me? Yes, I can, thank you. Okay, I'm on a borrowed computer, so I'm never sure. Um, I just wanted to start by saying a couple words about Dean Biancavilla. I'm glad that we were able to remember him a little bit at the beginning of this. He, uh, I worked with him and Bob and a number of you on the um, SDAT project 
Mm-hmm. When was that? 12, 13 years ago? Yes. And just what a kind and thoughtful man who really dedicated so much of his life to making this a better community. I just, I, I was so saddened to hear of his death. So yeah. Yeah. about the, um, this proposal, well, first of all, let me just say, as somebody who's been part of the visioning process for this for such a long time, I, it sometimes gets discouraging that you have to look back so many years and you see that we were thinking about similar things a long time ago, but I, it really does feel like a moment where, where we can look forward, where we've stopped talking about if and started talking about when and how. And that is a giant step forward. And I'm really excited about this. And I, I wanna thank Bob all along for focusing on, on actually trying to help people see visually what we're talking about when we talk about reimagining this stretch of, of um, the I-81 corridor because you, you hear terms like community grid or the various terms that have been floated over the time and, and nobody has any idea what that looks like until you really see it. And so I wanna thank you, Bob, your visuals are always so helpful. Um, this, this idea for a, a development authority for the neighbors of I-81 is an interesting one that we have to, I mean, I think there already are a lot of people at the table who are already talking, and um, the, I know the Housing Authority has a lot to say about what's going to happen in this corridor, because a lot of it is um, Syracuse Housing Authority land and property. And um, I, I think it probably makes sense to have some overarching entity, but we want to make sure that it comes from the community rather than being imposed on the community. So that's that's my one concern about creating something called a development authority that we, we want to make sure that uh, it's, it's more ground up. Mm-hmm. And I know that's hard because a lot of these decisions are going to have to be big and overarching decisions, but but I think one of the lessons of everything that's gone wrong in the past in this city is that the right people haven't been at the table. And so I'm encouraged that the, the mayor convened a big table conversations, and I think a lot of the right people were at that table from uh, community members to labor organizations to DOT, you know, just the, the whole gamut, but it's a complicated process to get everybody together. Um, I guess I just want to say, you know, I I know that there are a lot of entities at the state level that are really eager to see this happen and to see it happen in a way that really transform Syracuse for the better. I, I'm pleased to say that we now in the Senate, we have a committee that is dedicated to upstate cities. The chair of that committee is Jeremy Cooney, who's new state senator from Rochester, but he worked in the, as the mayor's chief of staff and mm-hmm. has been really involved in the inner loop project mm-hmm. in Rochester. And so I wanna make sure we bring him here. We really, get that committee activated at looking at Syracuse and the other upstate cities where, where you know, we've seen so much disinvestment and bad planning over the years and where we have such opportunities. So I wanna be part of that, making sure we've got that state legislature conversation going and otherwise just happy to be helpful and um, excited to see this finally moving uh, <laughs> forward. <laughs> After so many years. <laughs> oh, I hear you. Rachel, great, great comments. Just terrific enthusiasm. And you're right. You you have to celebrate at these times when you're making progress and then go back to work. But it's interesting. The coordination for upstate cities has been a long and a battle. And and there's such a difference between I see Mark down there nodding his head, yes, about the issues that are so different yet need to be addressed with uh, upstate and downstate issues. 
And the fact, uh, and again, you go back to compliments to Dean. Dean, we actually worked to coordinate some of the AIA state, upstate cities coalitions. And Dean put together meetings and we went to visit the different primary cities to coordinate this kind of approach. So these little steps that we make in planning uh, work. And again, Dean was part of that, Rachel. Thanks for mentioning every those kind words you had for, for Dean. Um, as I look at this again, and our plan is going fairly well, uh, I'm wondering if uh, either uh, Ben or Mark, I can say number one, we, the, these two gentlemen, uh, Mark Wooders from Brooklyn and Ben Carruther from Washington, D.C., are uh, National Congress for New Urbanists uh, managers and and uh, and Mark, you're on the, uh, the trustee, I believe. I've got it wrong, but you're a, one of the key people nationally. These these two gentlemen uh, have have uh, significantly uh, significant knowledge on national projects for removing highways from the centers of cities. And Mark, in particular, and I don't know his resume well, but I I've enjoyed everything I've seen about it. Has done has done some critical things about resilience. I mean, talk about looking to the future, whether it's storm, water, or infrastructure, or just nature, the resilience of communities. And I'm wondering, uh, 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 Mark, if you might take the lead here, Mark Wooders from Brooklyn and uh, his own architectural firm, uh, and just respond in general to this kind of uh, concept for taking a highway and looking at it as a neighbors of the impact and is and then trying to create a a focused uh a focused uh incentive zone for these neighboring conditions uh that we're that we're suggesting here today right thank you bob for inviting me um so appreciated and and so Congratulatory to all of you who have fought for for this uh, proposal um, to transform I-81. Such a, these efforts never come easy. It's often decades of work. So um, congratulations for getting this far. Um, I'm an urban planner. Um, I've worked in cities all over the U.S. and sometimes out of the U.S. Um, and one of the conversations that comes to mind is I was working in a city that actually had a truck. I work, almost every city has a truck route that goes through the city. Mm -hmm. Some of them already have them at grade. Like they never made it to the elevated highway stage. They have them at grade and yet they are still a problem. So, and it's exactly what Bob was talking about at the beginning is that what many cities find is that they divide the city even if they are at grade, if they are designed for higher speeds. Um, if they are designed for these big, you know, radiuses for truck motions, and they divide the neighborhoods and they hamper the local economic development because nobody wants to be next to them. And they, they hinder pedestrian crossings. And so I think that decision of how you design so that this is about, you know, um, pedestrians, that it really makes safe crossings. Um, and so that it becomes a development uh, growth opportunity for you. Um, is, you know, that decision, uh, I think the success of what it could bring to Syracuse is going to revolve around the decision of being able to make it pedestrian uh, friendly. Um, the, um, there's, a, you know, there's a lot of planning, a lot of physical planning, a lot of people who can talk about FAR and square feet and zoning. Um, I really appreciate that Bob uses the word neighbors and neighborhoods. Because ultimately, that's really where you want to succeed, is in supporting the existing neighborhoods that are along the corridor, um, as well as attracting uh, maybe some new neighbors. Um, in this day and age, we find that the popularity of cities has really placed a lot of pressure on existing communities. Um, I've worked for over 20 years in low-income communities with public housing residents. Um, and, you know, people always tell me, Mark, you know, it's not just about the sticks and bricks, it's about the people. And, you know, really um, understanding how you support existing communities, minority communities,
um, um, there's so much that the, that people contribute uh, when you have a stable community. Uh, it provides an environment for for job growth, for culture. Um, so, um, so this is a really important thing to take, be considerate of. The community land trust that Bob mentioned previously. I've been looking for over a decade for a tool to help stop displacement of not small businesses when you see gentrification coming into a neighborhood and also people who've been in a neighborhood for 30 years suddenly they're getting pushed out i've been looking for what a good tool would be a community land trust is one of those tools that seems to be um, very promising there are 250 across the u.s there are some national organizations that really can provide some expertise um, and what they do is they take property um, and it basically becomes acquired by a nonprofit. Um, and then there are members who would then live on that land, let's say if it becomes a housing property, who are on the board. And essentially they then can insulate themselves from a speculative real estate market. So if rents are suddenly rising up all around them, if, if really the tenants are part owners of that community land trust, they don't have to raise rents on themselves just to keep up with speculative prices. It provides a stable environment, not, and it works not only for housing that's rental, but it can work for affordable home ownership. It also can work for small businesses. You know, so think of it also as an opportunity to provide you know, startup businesses, minority-owned businesses, a stable environment for some people to really be creative uh, and, and, and then and keep neighborhoods alive uh, in, you know, what you're going to experience is a period of growth. Um, I love the idea that, you know, you're thinking about this as an overall, you know, sort of framework to look at the whole corridor. I mean, I think that's really uh, important. Um, so I'll end there. Okay, Mark, that, those are terrific ideas, and I appreciate this as, as a very quick response of a very complicated situation, so it's great to hear your thoughts. Um, the, uh, I was thinking of something else there that, uh, that about your efforts. I wanted to say something about the CNU again to our whole, all of our listeners here today. The CNU has uh, been very helpful to Syracuse in this effort. Uh, we brought John Norquist here in 2013 to speak on continuing the, the issue of sustainability. I was and there. he was a champion. He loved he loved the city. He loved the architecture yep. of the city. Yep. And uh, he, he, he had all the passions he did for Milwaukee when he did it. But he was a speaker. And um, and then uh, the year after that, that was 2013 and then 14, the CNU, uh, he came through the city, Andy Maxwell and the former mayor went, and, and not the mayor, but uh, Van Robinson and Bill Simmons from Syracuse Housing Authority and counselor at the time, I believe. And uh, Andy Maxwell went to San Francisco, thanks to the CNU, and looked at the Embarcadero and looked at the, got some vision. And what Rachel said is so true. The visioning of these plans and these words that we use are the essential communicator to really get the vision for what can transpire. And CNU's been very helpful there. And then I had some slides in here that never got into the show today of when in, uh, at, at your CNU National Conference in uh, Louisville two years ago, how uh, 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 Lynn Richards, uh, uh, we met her in Rochester, and then she said, come on right down to, to Louisville. We came down with uh, Sharon Owens, Deputy Mayor for the City of Syracuse, and Dean and myself, and we did a thank you, thank you very much, a, th a three-hour charrette with your group the last day. I mean, this was the last day of it. Were you there, Mark? I almost thought you were. It was the last day. I wasn't of, there. Yeah, I thought so, the four-day charrette. And uh, people still kicked in. It shows you the passion of, of design and problem solving and, the and really designing quality of places. Because they kicked in and they did a three-hour charrette with drawings, plans, videos, and comments from, from so many architects and urban planners. Uh, it was very positive. And in that sense, uh, this community, this community of Syracuse and Onondaga County 
um, has has really been served very well by the CNU, and I've always wanted to have us be a community chapter the way you do nationally, so we get more people from our oh. professional community into the organization. Um, Please. Maybe speak to that for a second, how that might work. Well, um, thank you so much for, for recognizing CNU's work. Um, you know, we're really dedicated beyond, you know, just our, our day jobs to, to high quality urban planning. I helped organize that 2013 conference in Syracuse at which uh, uh, John Narquist spoke. Yeah. So we, we really enjoyed being there. Um, we, have, we actually hold regional urban planning conferences in different cities of New York. We try to do them yearly. So we've been to Rochester, we've been to Buffalo, we've been to, um, we've been down to Terrytown. We've been, we've been in, in a number of places. Um, so, because we know that a lot of parts of the state don't have necessarily all the urban planning resources that some of the bigger cities do. Um, so we're, we're very mindful uh, of, um, of, of that. Um, the, um, I think, a lot of people at CNU have really donated time to the urban highway issue um, because CNU has such a long track record of looking at transportation issues as being, you know, how do we get away from this sort of car oriented, vehicle oriented mentality and really looking at neighborhoods and how, and how transportation can work as a network that supports neighborhoods as opposed to transportation that's just you know, about zipping, zipping yeah. through getting from here to there. That's been part of the DNA of CNU for 30 years now. Um, and so we, um, Ben Crowther, who I hope is, is who I think I see is on the line, Our next um, has organized CNU's national effort around freeways. Um, maybe he should speak also next. Um, but we all see the issue not only as reinforcing neighborhoods, but what we've also really recognized is that so many of the highways were cut through minority neighborhoods, that so many of the exhaust fumes are, you know, really contributing to health problems of minority neighborhoods. And so we're now mindful that as we repair these, um, uh, these highways and turn them into some sort of a boulevard or something neighborhood oriented, that we um, are finding ways to strengthen, protect, existing minority communities uh, along them. So, Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Mark. Thank you. Uh, you've, you've also set up Mark Wooter, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Ben Crowther as our next speaker. And uh, Ben is, as Mark has just said, national coordinator for the recent report that came out just uh, just 11 days ago on uh, freeways without, a f without futures for the 15 highways across the United States that are taking down freeways through the center of cities, of which Syracuse has been in there from almost the beginning. Um, uh, ben, um, I, I've asked Ben to speak. There's two things I wanted to say. One is we're trying to save at least 15 minutes at the end of this for Q&A from the full, full group, and, but maybe Ben might speak. To, I've asked him to think about speaking to other other uh, resources that are being, some newer resources that are being thought about or created around the country to help the neighboring context or, or uh, other funds for alternate approaches to highway, to, uh, to supporting highway project changes. So uh, Ben, what did you, can you got some thoughts to share? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'll, Bob, I'll say that uh, I-81 has actually been the only highway that's been in all seven of CNU's freeways about futures reports. So that's a testament to your all uh, longevity in, in this fight, uh, in tenacity in this fight. Yeah, so I, you know, I was thinking of as, as you were speaking, Bob, about how do you make, you know, something like you're proposing here, this, this zone of reality in terms of, of funding. Um, and uh, I'm, you know, seeing you as Washington, D.C. based. Uh, we've done a lot of work with the federal government on helping um, develop some federal uh, highway removal programs. And so I just wanted to sort of think about how that could interact with, um, you know, what you all are doing in, in Syracuse right now. I think, you know, you're all probably aware about uh, the Biden administration's uh, call for a federal 
uh, highway removal program and you know highlighting i think uh, i81 at least in one of those uh, public releases for it um but you know where that stands right now in terms of actually getting money um yeah and, is what uh, Governor Cuomo said. He's looking for a 2022 start on, on this project, I believe. Um, there's sort of four pathways at the moment, four different bills that are active in, in the House and Senate. Uh, and that's that have highway removal programs in them. That's, that's like a decent number. That's more than you know, really have ever existed. Um, and there's, there's, I won't speak, you know, so much to the uh, chances of these different uh, programs going forward. They would pay me a lot more money if I actually knew that answer. Um, but, you know, at the same time, I think NICE that um, is probably inclined not to leave this potential money on the table. Um, and they're probably thinking about that, I imagine, as they go forward with the program. Um, and, you know, the good news here is at least uh, you know, the majority of three out of four of these programs, uh, I believe, they have money that's potentially here um, to fund something like what you're talking about, this, about this, you know, smart growth zone. Um, and, you know, there's so, in particular, there's to look out for the um, Senate Den Democrats have uh, put forward uh, the Reconnecting Communities Act. Um, it's a $15 billion program, uh, and it sort of falls, the money falls into three buckets. Uh, com there's community engagement, education, and capacity building grants. There's technical assistance and feasibility uh, studies grants, and there's the capital construction, actually, you know, taking down the highway grants. Um, and the community engagement and education and capacity building grants are interesting here, I think. Um, Mainly because nonprofit uh, uh, are, are eligible to apply for this sort of money. Um, at a, it's a hundred percent federal share too. So you know this is this is the type of stuff I think that you're thinking about. Mm -hmm. um, I pulled up. Well, you were talking. You know some of the eligible activities, and it sounds totally in this ballpark. Things like uh, to educate community members about opportunities to affect transportation, economic development, planning, and investment decisions identifying community needs and desires for community improvements, develop community-driven solutions to local challenges. Um, you know, and that sort of money, I think, uh, if that was to become available, could be applied to something like, like this. Um, you know, it's unclear uh, because IE1 is so late in the game, if this money is intended to be used at the start of the planning process or if it could be applied here, but I don't think there's anything in the bill that would, um, you know, negate that. And the other important part of at least a few of these bills, the one that's uh, in, in the Senate Democrats have proposed, another one that House Democrats have proposed, um, is they both have uh, requirements to different degrees uh, that anti-displacement uh, strategies are in place be, uh, for projects to be applied to the capital construction grants. Um, and this can include community mm -hmm. land trusts. So I think, you know, if as you're thinking about something that's parallel to what NISDOT's doing, um, you know, if they're thinking about trying to access some of this money through capital construction, uh, capital construction grants, um, you know, they're going to have to be thinking about uh, these anti-displacement strategies or, you know, community land trusts, implementing those. Um, and that gives, I think, some leverage to thinking about, you know, setting up as you have yourselves as the partner in this opportunity um, to, to access some of that capital construction grant money uh, that could be coming down the pipeline. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. I think that's sort of, you know, that's great. That's where federal, you know, thoughts are on these sorts of programs. Um, and with any luck, fingers crossed, knock on wood, all the good stuff, uh, we'll see some, some movement and traction on that. And, uh, the coming months. Thank you, Ben. That's that's the exact kind of vision looking forward that that is so that is so helpful to us. And please jot down those titles for us, and we'll send them to our local community if you can. Um, <clears throat> I do want to thank all of the participants here today, and, and including our listeners, but certainly to both Ben, Mark, and the senator, and uh, Joe, 
And uh, Linda Urban was not able to at the last minute to join us, but she uh, really wanted to chime in and see this as well. Um, and with that, John, I would like to say, I'm gonna turn it back to you to, so you can handle a Q and A with our group, but it's so important to understand the resources of this group, the Greening USA group. And what I mean by that is, last month, Diane had about 10 speakers showing the skills of this community in all the kind of specialized green incentives that could go into this Neighbors of ID1 development zone. You have your alternate vehicles, you have your clean land, clean earth, alternate energy, uh, all the smart growth, the land trust, all from our previous meeting where we had our different local uh, entities showing their strengths in these zones. We could put this together very quickly. So with that, John, I'll say that's essentially the presentation and thank you to our participants and speakers. And I'll turn it back to you for Q&A, John. Yeah, thanks, uh, Bob. It was a great uh, presentation of, uh, and a, a lot of work went into this. So I appreciate your work and organizing it and for our, our responders to be here today uh, with us. So it was, uh, it was a, a very informative presentation. I do see a question from someone by the name of owner. Um, if the owner is still here, uh, could you please identify yourself and uh, give you a chance to raise your question? Don't forget to unmute your mic. Hello. Yeah, well, it's possible that owner has left the building. Um, so um, I suppose we can uh, open this up. I, there, there, there was a comment in the chat. I'm not sure if Abdul, you want to uh, mention that. Uh, I'm not sure that you were expecting a, a, that to be as a question or uh, otherwise made uh, uh, public. Abdul, did you want to say uh, something? Uh, yes, um, I've been working for the past 10 years from Albany to Buffalo, and I totally agree with what you're saying. Only problem is because of the disconnect between those who are making decisions and those who are impacted, as planners, we are to empower people to be decision makers. Uh, I, I really appreciate uh, the planner on board. I, I recently became a planner about five years ago. Um, this year, I became a community economic development professional. These are the things that we need to help people in these neighborhoods become stakeholders. Then when they get with professional groups, they're in a better position to make the better decisions because there's another $6 billion on the table that we could get in central New York because we're in the heart of the, the state. Everything passes through Syracuse, north and south, 81 and 90. Amazon see it, we see it, but one thing I really respect about uh, Bob is that um, he really touched on those things that we're really concerned. We can't overlook how to deal with people who are displaced. If we don't address those issues, we're not going anywhere, repeating the same mistakes. So what we want to be able to do is start educating people to assume these positions. Once they assume these positions, then they're in a better position to negotiate on bigger projects that unite from Albany to Buffalo as upstate. All the organizations I belong to have upstate chapters and we represent everything above uh, Westchester County. So if we take that collective approach and our collaborative efforts, we can do a lot more than we're doing. And that's what I wanna be able to bring to the table. However, you can't make progress doing the same thing that we did expecting a totally different results. Right. Right. Bob? Abdul, can you just uh, can you explain uh, your organization? 
Well, I got a chance to meet with a woman that some of you may be familiar with. She was the regional manager for HUD, Amatula Yamini. She left the city several years ago. She was very instrumental in getting local groups and organizations to take on responsibilities, but without the academics, without the qualifications, you were really talking apples to oranges, but they're talking about fruit. So you have to be very specific. The best thing about I-81, because it's under control of the um, US DOT and state DOT, they have to follow the mandates. They have no other choice, but if you don't know about it, you can't bring it to the table. And once you know about it, what other options do we have? We have 36 people who can bring something to the table. Collectively, we can educate people not only in the South Side, the West Side, how we can come collectively to make Syracuse a part of the broader upstate community. That way we can benefit from the advances that are taking place in Albany, the historical uh, neighbor development, tourism, because remember, one of the Tubman's house is only a thrown stone away from Syracuse. Many people don't realize that women's movement started less than 100 miles from here. We can become a destination location from Albany all the way to Buffalo, and everybody benefits like we did when we introduced the Erie Canal. Thank you for that. We are already a sustainable city. I don't like smart growth. I had to do a paper on it because it doesn't, it says the same thing, but when you get into the details, it leaves out the environmental justice aspect of it. Because mm -hmm. when I see buildings going up, I don't see the workforce development component. When I don't see the sustainable development component, you cannot possibly have community and economic development because you're working around the people who you're trying to help as opposed to engaging those people where they become a part of process and they take ownership. There was a paper I did on what would happen if the past discriminations hadn't taken place. Uh, there was a report that we lost over $16 trillion in GDP. Imagine if all these poor people or disfranchised people were paying their fair share of taxes. We wouldn't have a national debt. And the bottom line is that when it's economically feasible, it doesn't harm the environment, and it empowers people to take ownership. That's the greatest thing that we could do as professionals, help people take ownership in their decision making. And again, I can't thank Bob enough for his relentless and uh, sticking to his guns on uh, trying to help the community. I was looking forward to seeing other people there, but we have more than enough people to make this work. The idea is that we have to network with Albany. We have to network with Buffalo because the only two areas in New York State that has a membership, the American Plan Association, University of Buffalo, University of Albany, Cornell. Collectively, we can make New York the Empire State once again. And, you know, that's, that's the direction we're headed. Thank you. Thank I love you, Bob. You're a good guy. <laughs> All right. uh, we have time for maybe another question. Uh, if there's someone else, I see. Um, I know. No, I know that someone uh, raised their hand and, uh, using the handle of uh, owner. I suppose uh, if there's a possibility that you don't want to identify yourself, but would like to ask that question, either uh, type it out or um, unmute yourself and go for it. Anybody else who's interested in or has a comment, a question would like to make, uh, um, please uh, raise your hand. Dave, I can't see you. Yeah, Dave, uh, Ashley has, Dave Ashley has a question. I would like to thank Bob for, for a great presentation and, the, and his guests. I think, I think it's a very, these are very important uh, uh, things that we, unfortunately, we should have been doing these things two years ago. And, and, and on, then one of the things that happened, 
and I'm not sure exactly why, is that that the community itself never got involved in the in the project in an organized way. And what I what I mean by that is if you use Milwaukee as the example, uh, they, they had a highway removal project uh, where they they set up a actually there were two groups one was a city group and one was a, a county and city group and they hired they hired two planning a uh, uh, two planning planning agency firms and they they working with their state dot came up with some some whole new uh, uh, planning things for the land uh, the extra land that was developed uh, plus uh, plus the adjacent land, and now they have millions and millions of dollars of redeveloped land and new buildings and a very successful project. But th that never happened here, and we're literally only weeks away from the end of our project from a planning standpoint, which is very unfortunate. But I, I want, <laughs> well, and one of the things that never did happen, unfortunately, and maybe it's impossible, but if you just, I, I want to put a B in your bonnet to think about this. The project never really devoted any funds, any resources to anything uh, uh, south of, well, much, really much south of Adam Street. Uh, right. Because when, when you get to Calvin Street, we never got, we never got the, the full interchange we wanted there. And everything died from there south to, to 41. What we could have done, and may, I mean, it might be still possible. For example, if you gave up the money and the, and the resources for the, the the west side, west the west street redevelopment area, because 690 is 20 years is 20 years younger than 81, and we could carve that off and use the money on the south side. And here's what you could do: you could lower, you could bring 81 back down to grade at Calvin. Keep it on grade, remove all that fill down to Brighton, and then go back up again. And and with the the extra width of right of way, you could have a whole a whole commercial area in there for the south side for for jobs and redevelopment and connecting in all the other streets, which would that would be a a, a vital transformation for the south. And then you take all the fill that you that you take out. Uh, from that area, and you use that an Onondaga Lake, starting where the railroad starts to take over the edge of the lake, up up there by the uh, halfway down from Liverpool. You fill out in the lake because right now the edge of the lake is worthless. It's it's railroad riprap. You know, no one can even walk there, much less use it. And so you you fill out. Uh, approximately 150, 200 feet. You continue the lake trail all the way down, uh, and also you develop uh, some 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 areas, uh, some natural areas, and some and some uh, 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 lakeside commercial areas like you would have up on on uh, Thousand Islands or someplace like that, where there's some commercial activity that that draws people in. So you see that we could have used the uh, the same money for some kind of a thing like that. In other words, I, I've already looked at the at the the fill exchange. If you take down all the all the earth, all the fill, that was all brought in. Incidentally, it's not natural from from Calvin down to Brighton. It's all fill. Take that down, move it out to Onondaga Lake, and create a new a new lake shore. You see, you're killing two birds with one stone, which would be a marvelous thing for the city in both ways. But unfortunately, as I say, we're we're probably weeks away from looking at at semifinal documents, and the chances of that happening now are are very small. But anyway, good job, Bob. I appreciate all everything you did, and it was a lot of work. I just wanted to say one last word, and thanks to everybody who commented, but thanks to our guests, the responders. Your your involvement in this and your time that you gave to this is very, very much valuable to us to get the other perspective. So thank you for giving us some time today to 
to Mark, to Ben, to Rachel, and to Joe, and certainly to Linda for joining on board. I like this concept where you bring in other expertise and, and share and, and float some ideas. So thank you all for your time today. John? Yeah, yeah, I see that. Uh, thanks, Bob. I appreciate that comment. Um, I, I see that uh, the question was raised here. Why does our Post Standard, our new, our local morning newspaper, uh, uh, keep publishing uh, harebrained ideas such as raising the height of the viaduct with a wondrous uh, structure? I thought the the Post Standard was for the grid design. It only complicates. Uh, um, discussion, you know, I, and I, 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 alongside that, I, 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 there was an article that I saw uh, with an idea to uh, use the existing viaduct to put on a public park or some other uh, elevated um, space that might even be used for a, sh a shuttle. Uh, service from, uh, you know, from uh, the Almond Street area to the North area. Um, can any of our speakers, uh, or maybe Bob, uh, want to address that uh, comment? Uh, uh, can I break in? My name is Ken Bovis. I know all you guys and wonderful uh, presentation and discussion, but I'm so frustrated. I'm 71 years old and I was, I was thinking maybe I'd really see the, the wonderful change that could happen with the grid. I'm not sure I'm going to live to see it because the post standard, it, it, it's, it's an enigma. I, I don't know what they're trying to do when they publish these harebrained ideas. Um, and it's just, it just com confuses the rest of the public. A lot of people just don't understand that you raise it, your ramps get a lot longer <laughs> and take more space. But uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, no, you're, you're, you're absolutely right, uh, owner. Sorry. And uh, the fact that that, that these some of these ideas are preposterous is really why they present them. Unfortunately, they waste space and time to some real answers. Uh, the concepts, of course, come from other areas like the High Line of New York City, which is a tremendous park created out of, you talk about re recycling embedded, embedded energy, that's probably one of the best examples ever is the High Line, how to use all the energy that's in that steel. But why does the media give, well, the, the extra high, uh, you're right about the concept of the extra high viaduct. You, this city is too short, too narrow to be able to go up 65 feet in the air and get down, and you wouldn't be in the city if you went up it and got to the height and then went down it. So that, that doesn't make sense. And unfortunately, the the, the concepts um, are not then balanced by the quality of the suggestion and then maybe measuring it against the reality of, of it as a solution. That's what's missing from the paper. Yeah. Thank you for the comment. Dave yeah. Rufus, good to see you on here, Dave Rufus. Uh, um, we have many people here today that are sharing this, and I think it means a lot to them to see some of these different points of view. So thank you, David. All right, and maybe with that, uh, we are at the end of our time. So let me offer my uh, thanks again to uh, our participants and you, our audience, for being here and your your discussion today. It was something uh, that's very important, and uh, we hope to hear uh, from you, Bob, to keep us informed uh, how we can continue to uh, work with you uh, on this uh, important topic. Thank you. If you want to read, I just mentioned to everybody also, uh, while I think of it, the, we are making a, the recording of this. It will be on our U, our YouTube uh, channel. Uh, unfortunately, we we didn't uh, real, realize we weren't recording until a, about maybe 10 minutes into the presentation, so we missed some of the early uh, remarks. But uh, uh, but the recording will 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 be there. And uh, thank you again. Look forward uh, to seeing you. Uh, uh, soon. Thank you.